بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي First and foremost, I'd like to uh, thank uh, all the attendees, virtual attendees for tonight's lecture. Uh, my name is Bilal Ali Ansari. I am the uh, liaison for the Department of Hadith at Darqasim and an academic advisor. And uh, inshallah ta'ala, I'll be your moderator for tonight. Uh, with us tonight is uh, an esteemed uh, scholar, uh, a polymath, uh, uh, a scholar of both Islamic sciences and um, science or the uh, the hard sciences, um, Dr. Muzaffar Iqbal. Uh, I'm briefly going to introduce him, inshallah ta'ala, and then uh, I'll give, inshallah, an opportunity for him to to share his uh, uh, knowledge and experiences with us in the field of the, uh, on the topic of the lecture. And uh, Dr. Muzaffar Iqbal, I have uh, had uh, knowledge of him for, I would not want to say, over a decade, and, uh, and then um, have had the opportunity to work with him in, in a certain capacity over over the last, uh, I would say, over five or seven years. Uh, Dr. Muzaffar Iqbal is the founder of uh, a critical project, uh, the Integrated uh, Encyclopedia of the Quran. And uh, he is the founder, president of the Center of, for Islamic Sciences, uh, which is based out of Canada. And he's also the editor of a, an annual journal of uh, Islamic perspectives on science and civilization uh, called Islamic Sciences. And he's, of course, the, also the general editor of the aforementioned seven volume or forthcoming uh, seven volume integrated encyclopedia of the Quran. Uh, this critical project is the first uh, English language reference work on, uh, I would say, not only the Quran, but also Islam in general. And it is, uh, you know, one of the uh, debts that is owed, intellectual debts that is owed to the Ummah by, uh, uh, by the Islamic or Muslim scholarship, uh, as, as the Encyclopedia of Islam printed by Brill over a hundred years ago uh, was for a, a long period of time the authoritative English reference work on Islam and the Quran. And, uh, you know, alhamdulillah, uh, the first volume of the Integrated Encyclopedia of the Quran was published in 2013. And then recently, uh, this project has shifted online uh, to make the uh, uh, second volume entries and all the way up to the sixth volume entries, inshallah, available uh, for access online. And uh, uh, this is, you know, a project that I feel very passionate about. And I, and I hope that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives uh, this opportunity, an opportunity to more and more people to uh, participate and contribute to this, this uh, essential and critical project. Um, just to give a little more background about Dr. Uh, Muzaffar Iqbal Saab, uh, Dr. Iqbal received his PhD actually in chemistry uh, from the University of Saskatchewan in Canada in 1983. Uh, and then afterwards, he left the field of experimental science to devote himself to the study of Islam with, I believe, a particular attention or at least passion, I could say, to, for, for the Quran. Uh, he was actually born in Lahore, Pakistan, but has been living uh, in, in, in North America since 1979 and has held uh, various academic and research positions at the University of Saskatchewan, uh, the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and uh, McGill University. And uh, since then, he's also pursued various research and study projects. Um, he has published uh, nearly 20, over 20 uh, books and edited and translated works, and has uh, published uh, nearly 100 papers on Islam. Uh, one of the particular areas of uh, specialization and interest to Dr. Muzaffar is the relationship between Islam and science and the intersection between uh, uh, Islam and science on one hand, but also Islam in the West. And one of the um, uh, books that I have benefited greatly from, uh, uh, or well, many books actually, uh, of Dr. Muzaffar well, that I have benefited from personally have been on this topic, but also Beyond that, he has a particular interest in pedagogy and Islamic education, and he contributed as a consultant on uh, a work that I'm currently reading, again, for the second time, uh, Concentric Circles, Nurturing on Wonder in Early Childhood. Uh, and uh, uh, he's also a, an editor for Ashgate's four-volume work, Islam and Science, Historic and Contemporary Perspectives. Uh, with that, I'll just introduce tonight's topic, uh, because I think uh, as, as I mentioned, the topic today is, is on the, the, the intersection between Islam and science. 
and uh, Dr. Mosover has written extensively on this topic. Uh, our topic today will explore various aspects of living Islam in the age of, quote unquote, the age of, of, of science, especially in reference to the various uh, epistemic or epistemological and ontological challenges posed by uh, scientific rationalism uh, to fundamental Muslim beliefs and about life and the cosmos. With that, I'll hand over uh, figuratively the mic to Dr. Muzaffar Iqbal. And if anybody has any questions, feel free to post those questions uh, in the YouTube chat. And then inshallah ta'ala, if there is time at the end of the uh, lecture, um, I will address those questions inshallah ta'ala. Thank you very much, Mulana uh, Bilal, for that very extensive uh, introduction. I don't deserve many of the things that you said. Uh, and I also want to, want to thank Darul Qasim for this opportunity for me to be able to uh, discuss this topic, uh, which has been of interest to me for almost a quarter century now, uh, but in a new way. Uh, I want to present something today that I have never really focused on in terms of uh, this layer that I call living Islam in the age of science and I'm very glad you said quote unquote age of science because I want to uh, have some reflections on that particular aspect. When I say I have never really publicly discussed living Islam, uh, that means that uh, there is a lot of theoretical work on the relationship between Islam and science, both historical and modern science. But what does it really mean for Muslims in the current age right now to, uh, to live Islam in the age that we are in? Uh, so that, that is going to be the focus, inshallah. But first, uh, there is a need to uh, actually see what we mean by uh, age of science. Um, I hope you can all see the screen. If you cannot, then just uh, send a note in the chat box. So this is the overview of uh, what I hope to do during the next 45 minutes. Uh, We cannot take things for granted anymore. We live in an age where everything needs to be spelled out because everyone seems to have their own definition of everything. So I want to be very frank. I want to be very open to uh, all kinds of uh, possibilities. Therefore, I decided to look at the question of, we live in the age of science. Now, this is something that everyone sort of takes for granted. Um, so what is meant by age of science is based on something historical. That is, every age has a lens through which it views everything else. This lens is produced by a supreme belief. And although for many civilizations, there is some stability in this supreme belief, but they do change over time, over centuries sometimes. But these changes occur at irregular intervals. So there are quantum changes. There are times when a given civilization goes through a fundamental shift in its basic composition. So we, when we think of Greek civilization, for instance, we think of philosophy. When we think of the time of Musa Islam, we think of magic. When we think of the time of the Prophet Islam, we think of the poetry being the highest form of expression. But behind these descriptions, there is something else. 
the Greek civilization had 12 Olympian gods and goddesses before uh, it shifted to attain a very high level of philosophy to the extent that uh, Greek philosophy continues to impact the contemporary world. Uh, likewise, magic, which became the lens through which uh, the Egyptians looked at everything, uh, was not there all the time. Egypt had one of the largest, most complex uh, system of gods in the ancient world. For instance, uh, their most important god, uh, Osiris, uh, was a god of the underworld, uh, that of fertility and the embodiment of the dead. And he could resurrect kings. So you see there is already a connection between some kind of magic and their belief in this particular uh, god. And his wife, uh, uh, she gave birth, birth to their son magically. Likewise, uh, in the time of the Prophet Islam, we have the poetry uh, that had achieved the highest form. Uh, so in order to sort of uh, look at more carefully what is meant by the age of something, when we say now that uh, during the time of uh, Musa salam, we could say that it was the age of magic. We have a very graphic description of what actually happened in the court of, uh, of the Fir'aun. When Musa salam goes to uh, call him, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. First of all, he asks, he tells him, he tells Musa alayhi salam, Kala fa'altuha izam wa ana min ad this is Musa alayhi salam responding to him, uh, because he tells him all the uh, favors that he had done to Musa alayhi salam. So setting that aside, uh, Musa alayhi salam says, well, that wasn't really all the favors are, yes, they were there when I happened to have that interaction with one of the Egyptians and he, he died. But that's not why I'm here. I am here to get Bani Israel out of your slave slavehood. And uh, he calls him to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Firan says, Wa ma rabbul alameen. Wa ma rabbul alameen. Yani, look at the, the way, look at the haughtiness of Firan. And uh, he doesn't say man, he says ma rabbul alameen. And when Musa alayhi salam responds that he is the rabb of the samawat and the earth, mama bainahuma in kuntum he looks around and he tells the courtiers, he looks around in the court and tells, look at, look at this person, look at this fellow. He is calling us to the Lord of the heavens and the earth. And uh, he responds by saying, uh, indeed, uh, this messenger looks like he's a madman. When Musa Islam continues to tell him that he is the Lord of you, your Lord and the Lord of your forefathers, he is the Lord of the East and the West and everything in between. But the instant, the, the important thing that I want to highlight is Kala Avalauji to Kabishai Mubin. When it comes to proof, what is the proof that Musa Islam has? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given him uh, the asa and, and, and his hand. These two signs, and they are both magical in the sense. Fir'an's first response uh, to the uh, people in the court, قَالَ لِلْمَلَاءِ هَوْلَهُ إِنَّ هَذَا لَسَاهِرٌ عَلِيمٌ This is a great magician. And he wants to take you out of your out of your land. So what do you suggest? What do they suggest? Now these are the wise people. These are the pillars of Fir'aun's authority. What do they say? Well, send people out and call your magicians. Why is magic so important in this whole scene? Is because magic is the touchstone of that age. Now, if we contrast this, uh, if we look more, a little bit more deeply into it, everything is built around a falsehood, al-batil. 
Firon's power is external to him. It's in the magic of the magicians. Magicians have no real power and they know it. Now, magicians are subservient to Firon because they ask for a reward. But the public, in the public view, Firon has the power, not the magicians and not the magic. So Firon is deluded, magicians are deluded, public is deluded. There is nothing haq in it, everything is batil. Now let's contrast this to something else. You see this? We have seen this scene over and over uh, when the pandemic started. These are the daily briefings. And uh, when they started at the White House, they were copied around the world by the presidents and the prime ministers. What is very interesting in this scene and what is comparable to scene what we just saw in the court of Fir'aun was that the real power, real power was not there any anywhere it wasn't Firon didn't have power magic magicians didn't have power but magic was supposed to have power now in this scene is the president of the united states who is giving the daily briefings about the state of the pandemic but he doesn't have the power he doesn't have the authority if he were to stand on his own nobody would believe him his authority his power lies somewhere there in this man on the right side on my right side, uh, is Dr. Fauci. Now, Dr. Fauci, every once in a while, the president, the prime minister, anyone giving the briefing would look back and say, science says so. What I am saying today is based on science. Now, the face of science is Dr. Fauci, because science says so. The real power, just like the magic, in the court of uh, Fir'aun, the real power in the public view is not the president of the United States, nor Dr. Fauci, but science. Now, the falsehood of all of this is, just like the falsehood of the magic, is that Dr. Fauci is not a scientist. He is a public health official. And there is no science involved in the predictions they are making, the models they are working, they are all statistic models. Some people are sitting in some drawing room, boardroom, etc., coming up with this false uh, uh, forecast because they have limited samples and all the rest of it. The point is, science is being used here as the real authority and it was copied, the model was copied all over the world by all the governments because the public believes that science tells us truth. So we are living in the age of science, just as uh, at the time of Musa alayhi salam, it was the age of magic. And we can extend this to other civilizations, other times, etc. But let's go back to a uh, little bit more depth in terms of how did science achieve this understanding how did science achieve this understanding uh, in the public eye? So, so that even a public health official can be falsely presented as science. There is a 400 years of story behind the achievement of this status by science. And it all sort of centers around the beginning of, uh, of this story which is in the 17th century. Uh, these are the people, their names are well known. These are the authorities. These are the people who constructed what is now called modern science. These are the people whose work, which is extremely important in many realms, this work is not to be belittled in any sense. The world that we live in, is basically a word produced by the work of, of these people. These are fundamental discoveries in the 17th century. The four fundamental forces, the, the gravitational force, the electromagnetic force, and the, and the strong and the weak forces between the, between the atoms in a molecule. These are four fundamental forces and everything else started to emerge around uh, this construction that happened. 
in the 17th century. And of course, from 17th century onwards, there are many other important discoveries, but the fundamental change, the fundamental shift in our understanding of the world we live in, the cosmos we live in, not just the earth, but the entire cosmos started in the 17th century. But for most people, it was not the work of Newton, the work of uh, Descartes or other scientists that was important. It was actually the use of that science in technologies that started to change the perception of general public about science. I'm taking one example that of telegraphs uh, to just give us a little bit of, pers of a more pers uh, perspective on how this happened. Um, can we send a signal? Can we send a piece of information from point A to point B? Um, this new discovery, uh, the uh, tele telegraph, uh, it was invented in uh, 1794. But behind the invention of telegraph is the discovery of electricity. Now, electricity behind the discovery of electricity is the understanding that there are positively and negatively charged particles uh, that can travel in a physical space. People don't know this, they don't need to know this, but what they know is that a signal was sent by so and so, and over time this technology started to improve. And uh, um, we could actually print those signals over time. And this is a very, uh, I, I found, I find it very insightful that the first message that was sent uh, and printed was what hath God, God wrought. Uh, this is from new, uh, Numbers uh, 23. Uh, so from that time onward, it, progressed through technological advances. But all of this depends on this fundamental understanding, which was called the gold leaf experiment. And uh, uh, this is the transmission of electricity in vacuum from one point to another point that became telegraph. Now, how many people know science behind technologies we use? Very few. One of my favorite examples is this Boyle's Law of Gases. Um, Robert Boyle uh, was a British chemist. Uh, he discovered that uh, the pressure of a gas is inversely proportional, or proportional to the volume. So if we have a one liter container, we fill it with, with gas. And then if we press that gas, and move it to a half liter container, it would be under pressure. Now, somebody 100 years, 150 years later came along and he said, oh, wait a minute, I can run a piston with this compressed gas. So if I just have a pinhole, then the gas would come out uh, with pressure and I can have mechanical work done. Finally, it turned into this steam engine. People saw steam engine, they didn't see Boyle's law of gases. Boyle's law of gases is science, steam in engine is not gas, it is technology. So the point is that science gave birth to technologies. People saw technologies, they were told, this is what science can do for you. And they started to believe in the magic of science. So science started to gain currency in public view. Technologies created wealth, wealth created more and better technologies, better technologies created more wealth. And we know how over the last 400 years, we have moved from one technology to another technology, but in public view, it's all science. To the extent that now we communicate, right, like right now, we construct our houses, we, we grow our food, all through use of science and both science and technology. And it also changes uh, a nation's wealth. 
we saw what happened during the pandemic and we are still seeing the, the impact of concentration of the, of the manufacturing superpower. These are the side notes and they all depend, they all require separate presentations. The, the single point that I wanted to make is that we are living in the age of science, uh, which is actually the age of technology, but people know it as age of science. Now, it's the technology that impacts our lifestyles, even the places of worship. This is 1887 to 2015. The sacred most place on earth, how it has changed. In the 18th century, technology started to become a state tool. States realized that uh, technology can generate wealth as well as political power and military power. So it became a national pride. It created more and better technologies. Better technologies led to global colonization by those who had an edge on, edge in the development of technologies. So I hope it's clear that uh, how we, what, what is meant by age of science. Let's see how living Islam means in this, in this context. What is living Islam? Islam living Islam means beliefs and actions. We have beliefs and we have actions. And that's when we say we live Islam, we live, we perform actions on the basis of beliefs. Actions are both individual and, uh, and with the community. Now, every community is surrounded by other communities and uh, technology has produced a great deal of uh, globalization. As we all know, barriers have been removed. Uh, what happens in one place on earth is globally known very quickly. Uh, but the global Muslim community, the place where we are living Islam, uh, Muslims don't have a control on the direction in which science and its applications, meaning technology, are proceeding. They have had no input in the making of the world in which we are living. So technologically, economically, military, in terms of military, all of these uh, are actually not the construction uh, of Muslims. And uh, uh, Marshall Hodgson had said in 1974, uh, something very insightful. He said that uh, Western civilization uh, went through a deep transformation beginning in the late 16th century. And by 1800, there was no place left on earth. There were no people left who were not impacted uh, by what had happened in Western Europe. All people had to adjust their governments to modern European international political order, but also to adjust their economic uh, economies, as well as their uh, uh, their modes of living, and uh, he called it uh, European hegemony. So we have living Islam means beliefs and practices. Practices happen in space. Space now is largely dependent on technology. Technology is, is a product of the needs of a civilization. The needs are based on beliefs. So whose needs technology is fulfilling? First of all, of those who actually develop it. Now, our beliefs are solid. Prophet ﷺ told us that he is leaving behind So I'm leaving behind you two things, two matters. If you hold on to them, you are not going to go astray. Allah's book and uh, the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Now, based on these two sources, we have a complete system of beliefs give, which gives us a metaphysical view of reality. It also gives us an epistemology, how we know what we know. It gives us a very specific view of who we are as insan, human beings, 
We have a very specific view based on our beliefs, as well as our fundamental understanding of time, origins, and history. All of these are based on our beliefs. Now, in the age of science, all of these beliefs are being challenged. All of these beliefs are being challenged in the age of science through another set of beliefs constructed on the basis of age of science. In fact, this age has its own idols. It's a new jahiliya with its own reigning paradigms. And these have emerged over the period of last four centuries. Even within the Western civilization, there has been a radical break with the medieval Christian civilization. When the age of science emerged, it simultaneously had a theological and a philosophical reconstruction of the Western civilization. This is not the topic of today's talk, how the Western civilization moved from the 17th century to the 21st century in its own fundamental view of reality of the cosmos and human being. From Descartes to Nietzsche, we have a journey of a civilization that can be summed up in a few quotes. Now, reason is the only reliable method of attaining knowledge. This is Descartes' fifth meditation, idea of a being that is supremely perfect in, and infinite of all the ideas that are in me. This, the idea that I have of God is the most true, the most clear and distinct. Now, Descartes was a Catholic. Uh, he had belief in God uh, in his own way. But because he made it subservient to his reason, Pascal uh, was really displeased. And he said, I cannot forgive Descartes. Uh, in all his philosophy, Descartes did his best to dispense with God. All he did, needed was uh, just God to start, set the world in motion with a snap, and then he didn't have any need for God. Now, this is 17th century. By the time we arrive in the late 19th century, we have Nietzsche declaring God is dead. God remains dead. And we have killed him. Now, all of this is like these are just tidbits of, uh, of the journey through which we arrived. And in between, of course, we have uh, the answers to the most fundamental question about the origin of life. Uh, and again, I'm not going to go into the details of these. The topic I want to cover is how to live Islam in a world in which the kingdom of God has been substituted by the kingdom of man. So even like the 17th century, we see Western civilization reconstructing itself on the greco roman model, but that is long gone. Instead of gods and goddesses of the greek roman civilization, it has constructed its own idols and its own worldview where man Human being is the supreme measure of all things. Individual freedom is the ultimate goal. And science is the new religion. Scientist is the high priest. The interesting thing is that uh, uh, this civilization, this worldview believes in its own superiority and universality. Now, this is a claim that Islam also has. It's a universal religion it's for all humanity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the Prophet to all humanity for all time to come. And the Quran is the book for all time. Now, we have a clash of two claims. Uh, for the Western civilization, there is no doubt that uh, the destiny of humanity is Western civilization or the ideals of the Western civilization, scientific rationality. And all societies are going to come around sooner or later. Uh, it's acknowledged that some societies are not ready yet, but in time they will be ready. So what we have 
is a challenge to the most fundamental beliefs emerging from our uh, belief in Islam. We have a metaphysical challenge uh, in the sense that uh, we believe that uh, the, the cosmos that we live in, all the planets, including Earth, it's a living creation in the sense that it responds to the creator. It's not an inert collection of atoms and molecules. Rather, uh, everything is everything hymns, glorifies the creator. The mountains, the trees, the particles of sand in the desert, the birds, everything is conscious of the creator. Uh, there is no such view for the modern scientific rationality. Uh, everything emerged. Uh, there is still this understanding uh, that uh, we don't know how the cosmos started. We don't know the origins. We don't know for sure, but we have mathematical models. We can, uh, we can assume there was a bang, big or small. And once we have the beginning, as Descartes had, then uh, we can construct a complete picture of the entire uh, subsequent events uh, based on our science. Now, this science, this cosmos has inherent laws, so-called laws of nature. Once we understand those laws, uh, we can predict events and we can know uh, things about uh, how uh, these entities would behave. We can predict uh, future events and we can look back as well. And there is no room in this model uh, for any creator. Uh, but the scientific rationality does not have a problem if individuals want to have their own private God. If they want to believe in it, that's fine. Uh, this is not really what the Quran teaches us, what the Prophet some taught us. This is not our understanding of the cosmos. Uh, so we have, a, we have two parallel claims here. Then there is a challenge to the origins. This is one of the most fundamental challenges uh, that science and scientific rationality has posed to our religions, but especially to, to, uh, to Islam. Uh, through construction of the picture of the emergence of life on the planet Earth in the 19th century. Uh, since Darwin, uh, evolution has gone through numerous evolutions and uh, uh, there is absolutely no way anyone can prove uh, or disprove evolution through science. Because what happens in this whole discussion that has been going on since Darwin uh, and is still going on is that uh, uh, it, is the, it is the house of science and scientific rationalism which opens the door and invites people of faith to have a dialogue, to have a conversation. And all the terms of conversation are their terms. And uh, within those, within that framework, uh, this uh, there is a beautiful uh, metaphor that uh, uh, Dr. Laham, Kareem Laham, had used. Uh, uh, it's like the it's like the Napoleon's army arriving in Moscow. Mm. The, the Russians had to do nothing. All they had to do was to wait for the winter, for the snow to come. 
and let the Napoleon's army go further and further, deeper and deeper from Moscow to Leningrad and Leningrad, what it was called Stalingrad, and other places. And all they had to do was to just disperse within that landscape until this huge dumps of snow came and they had no escape. So what this dialogue does is pulls the rug out from the fundamental definitions that we have and uh, brings us into uh, a defensive mode. Uh, because of the authority of science, it says we have to prove everything on the basis of scientific rationality. And anything that cannot be proven, uh, we cannot use that. So our understanding of who we are is based on in, of something that is not physical, that is the ruh. Nobody can prove the ruh. Therefore, uh, it cannot be established scientifically. And because they have a complete system of uh, even explaining the human consciousness, and some kind of intuition as well. Uh, what they do is they bring, uh, they bring us into their own, their own knowledge base, their own view of reality, and then ask us to prove that there is something higher than this. It cannot be proven. Uh, uh, through the scientific rationalism because the insertion of revelation into the human, human world, it's a metaphysical event which used to happen in the form of coming of guidance from outside the human domain. When we accept that uh, the, the, it's the human reason, the endless possibilities of the human reason, um, that is the ultimate. Then we have closed the door of revelation. So the question is, how can we live Islam, uh, both in physical space as well as in uh, uh, in the metaphysical realm? We also have a fundamental shift in our understanding of time. Um, according to the age of science, the paradigms of the age of science, the worldview of the age of science, uh, time is moving upward. There is progress in, uh, in human civilizations. You see, we can go to the, we can send our, uh, our inventions to Mars, Moon, other planets. Uh, it proves that we have progressed from where we were. We have tremendous amount of information that was never there. Uh, every single bone in the human body has been studied to the nth degree. Um, and you know all the rest of it. Of course, there is all this information. Of course, there is all this so-called development. But it hasn't changed fundamental human nature. Human beings are still human beings. Uh, human beings still have the same fitra. Human beings still have the same fundamental needs. Human beings still have the same fundamental five external senses and the five internal senses. So the progress that we see, yes, we can go from point A to point B in far less time. We can communicate in different ways which were not there. But how does that change fundamental issue of why we are here? And where are we going? What is the purpose of our life? 
how can we understand that the science and technology that can send these uh, space shuttles to far away planets uh, is unable to solve even the most basic fundamental human needs of shelter and food how can we understand the uh, the nature of reality itself so these are some of the some of the things that uh, that that muslims are faced with and we haven't done enough work to uh, produce a cohesive narrative that can stand in front of this or challenge in front of this challenge the very concept of who human beings are that is a that has changed um, let me just end by uh, one fundamental aspect of uh, the challenge that we have uh, i think that contains all the other challenges this is the view of time is every coming day better than yesterday in terms of human progress in terms of state of the human beings in terms of uh, where the humanity is going if evolution not just the biological evolution but evolution of ideas evolution of uh, of everything is is on the basis of better and greater uh, then we have a direct conflict with our understanding of uh, of time of where uh, time itself is in a, in a loss walas in an insan la fi khusr and we know we know for sure that uh, in a last time the time of revelation the time when a messenger a prophet used to be on the face of this earth walking and talking to human beings those correctives that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent from outside the human domain resetting the clock as it were came to an end with the coming of the prophet as salam and uh, we know that uh, in the, even in the hereafter the three grades kunt mazwaj an salasa fa ashabul maimunati ma ashabul maimuna within the ashabul maimuna within the people of the right there are the sabikun and they are the muqarrabun and then they are they are most of them are from the awwalin and the awwalin invariably in our tradition are people from the previous times we also have uh, prophetic guidance on this uh, uh, the prophet as islam said that uh, اسبروا فانه لا ياتي عليكم زمان الا الذي بعده شر منه حتى تلقوا ربكم there is no day that comes that there is no time that comes that uh, uh, it is worse than the previous time so that the the time itself is uh, is decreasing in quality and uh, yani to just to think of uh, the notion that uh, this individual the concept of insan we have now uh, even in the political realm one of the one of the greatest uh, idols of the age of science is of course uh, this institution political institution of uh, a system of uh, democracy so every one one person one vote uh, can you think of uh, if sayna abu bakr sadiq radhiyallahu anhu was living today and abu jahal was were, was also living and they both have one vote and their votes are equal so wala asrin al insan la fi khusr illa allazina amanu wa amilus salihati wa tawassaw bis حقي والتواصل بالصبر
I'll be I'm looking forward to your questions, inshallah. Well, uh, Dr. Mazafar, I really appreciate that uh, and uh, also appreciate that we had uh, quite a limited amount of time to be able to address a vast topic, uh, the vastness of which is not just demonstrated by the vastness of the topic of science, but also Islam and, and, and Islamic epistemology, etc. I, I had a question I'd like to begin with, inshallah, and then I'll, um, in the meantime, simultaneously open the floor for any uh, questions. Um, anyone who is viewing on YouTube can uh, use the chat box to direct their questions. Um, so, you know, one of the things that I think you, you brought up was <clears throat> the you know, he hegemony of, um, of worldviews. And, you know, the I think the critical approach that we must have towards any claim towards truth through the lens of science. Um, I think what tends to happen oftentimes as a result is a reaction to that sort of... Um, uh, monopoly uh, on certainty is that there tends to be an equal and opposite uh, reaction where then there becomes an assault on the, you know, uh, the hierarchy of knowledge and any authority. And, and we're seeing this quite commonly today where people are attacking all sites, sorts of, uh, you know, uh, 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 scientific truths and certainties. Um, and so I, I wonder how, what would be the balance in your, in your view and how would we approach, I think, what is a, a wave coming you know, forward where a lot of popular uh, figures in the media are beginning to challenge even fundamental uh, scientific uh, um, um, you know, uh, sensory truths that we know uh, through even the Islamic tradition to be un unchallenged. How would we address those, 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 those ideas? Obviously, we are living in a flux. We are living in uh, there is there is very little stability left in the world in terms of uh, uh, everything, including the ideas, the worldviews, and uh, the uh, the science scientific worldview has always been in a state of flux. Uh, from the 17th century onward, and it's still going through radical changes. But uh, what I don't see is the authority of science being challenged uh, within the established uh, structure. There are voices outside the structure uh, impacting certainties. And there have always been uh, Noam Chomsky's and, uh, and others. There have always been people within the establishment uh, of science who have questioned uh, the value of scientific truth. Uh, so if, if there is a crack, if there is an opening, uh, what other worldview would, is there to, uh, to fill that gap? Uh, my understanding is that uh, because of the certainty and the solidity and the incorruptibility of the Quran and the prophetic tradition within uh, this last religion that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent, this is our view, but it's also objectively possible to testify that there is no other book in human possession that can claim to have remained uh, unchained over this huge long period this can be tested of course the understanding of the quran the understanding of the sunnah understanding of islam is dependent on human beings and that keeps uh, in a flux etc but the at least the foundation is there there is no other foundation so uh, once there is a crack once there is an opening within this world view uh, are we able to uh, get into that space and produce something? I think that is the challenge that we we face as Muslims. I just like to for that answer. Yeah, I I, I think that was um, that's always a, a a timeless problem of filling the void when there is a need for that third moderate sort of approach towards uh, to to extremes. Uh, and I guess that's the challenge that we're going to have to face today 
And a lot of people, you know, even within the Muslim com community, uh, you know, interestingly begin to doubt, uh, you know, things like um, things that are 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 considered, uh, um, I wouldn't say unchallengeable, but you know, very obvious certain mathematical truths and scientific truths. Um, but on the other hand, then you have those who, who are not willing to critically analyze uh, things that they studied in school and believe them all to be uh, certainties, um, including, you know, those the things that are popularly still labeled as theory. Um, I, I don't see any questions, um, Dr. Mozaffer. So maybe I, 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 I think I want to little, expand a little bit more on that uh, sure. uh, the difficulty that Muslims have faced since. Uh, since the 19th century, uh, Muslim encounter, I had a few slides on that, but I took them out in the interest of time. Muslim encounter with science has, uh, has a history of its own, as you know. And uh, there, have, there have been people uh, who have rejected science, and uh, there have been people who were totally sold uh, to the idea of science. And this started with the reformers uh, uh, in the Muslim world. Most of the Muslim world uh, was under colonial rule when it encountered Western science. It had no science of its own. And uh, it, was, uh, it was a dynamic uh, interaction between a static model of um, because there was lack of knowledge production in the Muslim world for considerable time. Uh, so th so that, that encounter uh, produced that reaction to which you, you alluded to. Therefore, uh, it became, it became um, increasingly a divided world in which the madrasa was divorced from not only scientific knowledge, but also understanding what the other side was saying. Uh, this is all very well known. Uh, I think what we need to do is really understand not only uh, history, but also philosophy and history of science. And uh, this requires people who have uh, their feet in both worlds. Uh, people who can really understand uh, the history of science, where we stand right now, and uh, uh, not reject what is any uh, any what, what is that you know alluded to some fundamental truths like, like the force of gravity is force of gravity. <laughs> Whether we are in Mecca or uh, in Washington, D.C., force of gravity is there. The four forces are there. The world that we have constructed on the basis of our understanding of, of uh, atoms and molecules um, is not going to go away whether Muslims accept it or not. Like this is, But at the same time, the sum total of atoms and molecules in a given substance is not just those atoms and molecules. You see, that part is different. That part, uh, medicine is a very, very fascinating aspect of, uh, of modern science in the sense that I, I think you, you would probably recall that everything in traditional medicine, as still it has, it has properties. It is either hot or cold, dry or wet. Now, Pre-modern medicinal uh, system relied tremendously on these properties. We don't we don't give that much importance to th those inherent properties of tomatoes, for example. We have genet we are able to genetically modify the color, the gene that produces the color, uh, the taste uh, has gone out, but. We are able to genetically modify apples. We are able to genetically modify everything uh, to the nth degree, like take one single aspect of a given product uh, out of it and say, these bananas are going to have thicker skin now because they need to tra be transported from South uh, 
South America uh, to all over the world. Therefore, in transportation, we need thicker screen. We are able to do those things, but the, the taste of bananas have gone out. In the previous pre-modification pre, uh, system, uh, we didn't need to transport them. So there was a holistic aspect of, of fruit, of all these things. So without denying the ability of science to be able to genetically go deep into every single living organism and, and genetically modify things, even, even the medicines that we have now, like the scale and the, and the, and the, uh, the depth that they have to which they are affecting human being is so different now. So really, we, we, uh, we, I agree with you that we, um, there is this knee-jerk reaction to rejection because we don't have it. So we need to possess it and, uh, and uh, tame it. Yeah, uh, for that. Uh, I, I think a practical question to uh, follow up to that would be that, as you mentioned, that you know there needs to be uh, attention given from sort of both sides of the aisle, right? Those who have madrasa specialization or Islamic uh, studies backgrounds, and maybe have uh, limited exposure to the empirical sciences, and then and from the other perspective as well. So, practically speaking, what would be a, a, a course of action that you might suggest specifically for like students who are attending our classroom programs um, who don't have a background in uh, the empirical sciences. Um, and then what would you also suggest for someone across the aisle, right? Who might, who might want to kind of appreciate Islamic epistemology? I don't, I don't have much hope for across the aisle because the, uh, what the worldview that comes with a scientific training, the worldview that comes with, you know, if somebody has a PhD in biology, um, and nothing in Islam beyond the basic, uh, um, it's, it's very difficult. But I see great hope uh, on this side of the aisle because I think it would take one year at the most, one year of uh, uh, solid uh, study of science for someone who is trained in the Islamic sciences to gain a real understanding of, of science. He or she may not be uh, an expert biologist uh, at the end of the one year, but would know what is, uh, what is it that biology uh, is able to do. So there is great hope in, uh, in making an effort at Darul Qasim, for example, to start uh, a parallel study of uh, of science, including the philosophy and uh, history of science, but also the fundamentals. The fundamentals are very simple. I tell you, like, this is not bragging, but in 1971, uh, I had a cousin, Allah bless him. Um, I studied chemistry with him for almost uh, eight months. And after that, I didn't need to study chemistry until PhD. Like the fundamentals are so. Uh, once you, once you grasp the uh, the fundamentals, uh, it's very easy, really. So, so there is a way to uh, to bridge that gap, and I think there is hope in that. Uh, people uh, who are trained in uh, Islamic sciences receive uh, a real deep understanding of uh, the natural sciences and then uh, produce uh, works that would be beneficial for the Umar, inshallah. So Dr. Muzaffar, I'd like to close with just a, um, maybe another suggestion or a question for us, uh, a recommended uh, sort of path course uh, reading uh, list perhaps, because one of the common questions that we get as a result of uh, these lectures is uh, for further study or further reading, 
beyond, of course, connecting with 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 the scholars and lecturers. So one, uh, you know, a question um, I've read your the making of Islamic science, and I really benefited from that book. Um, but you also mentioned something about the principles of uh, science, right? And and as you mentioned, the example of chemistry. So where would be a good place to start to kind of understand that history and and the principles behind uh, behind science? So each, because the um, over the last 400 years, each of these uh, sciences, physics, chemistry, biology, astronomy, all of these sciences have, uh, have really uh, become so huge uh, that uh, what we need to do is uh, look at the overview, uh, overview of each of these, uh, these sciences. And uh, there are... Uh, and then in addition to that, we also need to have uh, have worked something like my Ashgate four volumes, which uh, uh, is a collection of uh, papers over the last 50 years uh, uh, in terms of uh, Islam or Islamic scholars uh, responding to modern science. So that's where the history and philosophy of interaction of Islam and science uh, is there. But each of these fields would require um, I cannot pinpoint uh, textbooks, but uh, I know they exist uh, in each of these fields, which would give us an overview of each of these uh, branches of science. So for, for a person who, uh, who has not studied in depth, uh, for example, chemistry, uh, I, I can easily see that just one year along with physics and biology, like these three sciences can be combined. Okay. Uh, there's a one question that just uh, uh, showed up on the chat. I'll, I think I'll, we'll finish with this. If you if you feel you have time to address it, it's a broad question, then uh, feel free to do so. Otherwise, you know, we can we can also just close up at, at this moment. Uh, the question is, Assalamu alaikum, what is the Islamic view of technological progress and how would we apply it in the current zeitgeist? So, Technology, uh, there is no single uh, Islamic view of technology. Technology has always been a tool uh, to construct and produce. Technology uh, has always been used uh, to make living easier and uh, each age had its own technology and uh, pre-modern technologies were uh, harmonious with the natural world uh, hajj for instance uh, has been going on for centuries when people gather in uh, arafat they need water there is no water in arafat A human need is there to bring water to Arafa. What did Muslims do? What did pre-Islamic people do? Like they, they transported water. But then comes Zubaida, the wife of Harun Rashid, and she says, Oh, there's lots of water in Taif. Engineers, can you do something? Can you build a way to bring water from Taif to Arafa? I really, here is, here is a lot of money, but whatever money you need, I will provide the money from my own personal wealth. What do they do? They use stones. <laughs> they, cre they create channels from Taif without any electrical pumps to bring water from Taif to Arafat. I have seen myself, those channels are still there. Those channels are still there. Harun Rishi's time. So what did they do? They used technology. We know that technologies were used for the Egyptian pyramids, for example. They are just mind boggling. So uh, I think there is, there is uh, Ahsan added to th these tools. There are ethical questions. Uh, there are also questions of sustainability, and there is also the question of preservation. Uh, there are lots of issues involved uh, in the use of technology. There are lots of uh, uh, lots of Islamic uh, uh, perspectives on uh, on on the invention 
and use of technology. Like technologies never had patterns. We had we had guild systems when the weaving, for instance, was the knowledge of weaving is a technology was passed from one generation to the next generation through the guild system. Um, so there are issues of that kind. Absolutely, that was excellent. I mean, that brought up a whole bunch of new questions, sustainability questions, preservation questions. I, I like this question about technology and patterns. Um, but I think we'll, we'll close, and I think that's a good a good way of closing. That you know, sure. there are a lot more questions than we can obviously uh, accommodate in this short period of time. But those questions are critically important, and uh, it, you know, we have to start at asking those questions. So I'd like to uh, just express my gratitude to again, Dr. Muzaffar, for your time, and um, and and taking out the time to also you know to present uh, that information and to answer the questions. I uh, would like to thank all the attendees and also Dr. Pasan and the uh, event management for allowing this program to happen. Um, inshallah, we hope that this will just be the beginning of uh, more fruitful conversations on this uh, on this topic. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the ability to kind of further uh, uh, develop uh, our understanding um, of the relationship between uh, science, empirical science and Islam, and, uh, and, and, and make this just like the first step towards uh, some impact, as Dr. Mozaffar, I, I, I like that you have a, a positive a hope in, from from these types of systems and from the institution, Dr. Qasim, the Madrasa system, that also brings me a lot of hope as well. And, and uh, I hope that, inshallah, ta'ala, Allah will, 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 will bring some um, uh, fruit, will, 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 will allow this uh, this conversation to bring forth some fruit in the future, inshallah. Jazakallah khairan. Is that the last item? Salam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.